Hi and welcome to Matrix Moments. This is Saloni and today's episode is an audio recording from Clubhouse where Tarun Davra, Managing Director at Matrix Partners India, recently did a session with Kunal Bell, co-founder of Snapdeal and Titan Capital. Through the course of this conversation, we cover Kunal's early childhood and background that helped shape him into who he is today the biggest learnings from his journey at snapdeal transitioning from an entrepreneur to an investor and what that was like for him life outside the startup and vc ecosystem and much more tune in firstly everyone who's uh, you know uh, joined in thank you so much uh, really appreciate you guys doing this this is the first time i'm doing this on clubhouse myself so if there are any glitches uh, apologies in advance uh, this is tarun from matrix for those who don't know me uh, we're in early stage uh, vc in india uh today's conversation is actually a part of our podcast series matrix moments some of you would be aware of those uh now we normally do this uh on on offline and then we put this up on our website uh and i'm told apparently that that's not cool anymore and so we're trying to do this on clubhouse for the first time uh joining us for today's talk is obviously someone who needs no introduction uh kunal is one of one of the founders that i met very early on when in my sort of uh, career in, star- in in startups and vc he's been obviously someone i have a lot of respect for uh he's taught me a lot just kind of observing him from a distance so kunal thank you so much for being here uh kunal is the founder and ceo at snapdeal and also the co-founder of titan capital we'll also talk about kunal's sort of journey from entrepreneur to being an angel investor and sort of everything in between uh thanks for joining us on clubhouse now uh thanks tarun it's always a pleasure uh, you've been such a dear friend for i think we are all belonging to the soon belonging to the geriatric society of indian startups um, <laughs> so but i think let's enjoy our youth while we can it's a pleasure being here and thanks for having me great and i just want to thank again everyone else who's you know joined in uh, obviously if you have questions please just raise your hand and we'll try and get to those towards the end of the chat so kunal i'm going to start with uh, a little bit of a trick question which uh, which wasn't something i had initially planned but uh, do you remember how and when we first met um i think we met in uh, <laughs> we met in uh, we, uh, let me tell you we, we met in trident uh, mumbai uh, maybe almost 10 years ago uh, or maybe a little bit more than 10 years ago Uh, yeah and you were at big rock then and and that conversation then led to uh, you joining step out uh, as a co-founder and then that led to you joining matrix so yes so yes fantastic. absolutely absolutely and 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 uh, i think had events unfolded a different way i potentially could have been part of snap deal as well so all, all that's always i count that as one of the missed opportunities yeah. for me but uh, <laughs> just just for the audience I, you know i was a, i was preparing notes for for this chat today and i was like hey let me go back to how do i actually know kunal and for those of you listening in i remember kunal had i can't remember kunal whether it was your series a or series b but it was this massive round and you had actually written to me on linkedin and and at that time i had no idea how this works i was i was at big rock with my blinders on building stuff and i remember either we go i can't remember for sure but either we got introduced with someone or i think you wrote to me on linkedin saying hey i'm in bombay let's catch up for coffee and i think we met at the trident uh we spoke uh, we spoke about me sort of wanting to stay in bombay for a while and you said hey if you ever change your mind let me know and you know we might have something for you at snap deal and incidentally after that while i was talking to step out to move there I think the founder of Step Out, uh, this is uh, Adam Sachs. Uh, he was talking to you as well, and incidentally, we, we both were talking to you without knowing the other parties also talked to you while we were sort of doing the negotiation. So uh, that was one funny incident. Indeed, indeed. Now it's um, it's been so long, but yet it I I still remember the couch you and I were sitting on um, uh, in the area of Trident, Trident Mumbai, where they don't offer you coffee. Yes, <laughs> so you, can a, you can do a free meeting there. Um, yes. So yeah, I do remember. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to start with I guess the first part of where I I really want to spend time, and this is for all the young entrepreneurs here, uh, all the all the people that count you as a role model. And so I'm I see start Deepak, who's not so young entrepreneur, also. <laughs> yes, Deepak. I see Deepak. I see Vitesh. I see Kuldeep. I see a bunch of folks here. So guys, thank you again for joining in. uh i'm going to start with the first question uh what kind of a child were you how would you describe yourself as a as a child 
Yeah, it was like super mischievous, um, uh, super, super mischievous child. But, and I never, never used to like to study. And I grew up in a household where there was so much emphasis on studying and doing well in academics. And my brother was really brilliant at academics, my elder brother. And so there was always this push to study hard and all I wanted to do, do was play. Uh, mm. I remember when my mom used to leave, go to the uh, market, I used to run to her room and switch on the TV and start watching TV, the two channels that used to be on those days. Mm. Um, and, and I would run back um, to the room when I would hear the gate open. And mm. she's my mom after all, so she would check the side of the, touch the side of the TV and she would know it was warm. Mm. And she knew I had been naughty. So <laughs> I think um, uh, I think that was a bit of my childhood. Just uh, I think in general I had like these two parts to me. One was this sort of mischievous, always up to no good, and the other part was which was a bit forced to be honest. Which is keep studying. You know, marks are important. Uh, doing something with your life is important. Mm. Interesting. And and. Were there any, I guess, early role models or mentors like that that played a instrumental role in you becoming an entrepreneur or yeah, moving I towards think, entrepreneurship? Yeah, I don't know if entrepreneurship, but I think more as a person. Hmm. Uh, you know, obviously, all our parents play a big role, right? So one can't take that uh, away from them. That that credit is goes to them. But specifically in my my life, I think growing up, my grandfather played a very instrumental role. He was in the defense services, very disciplined, where everything was always on time with him. He was an incredibly charismatic person. Like people would come and just listen to him. He was very, very inspirational. He had a really inspirational life. I mean, if, I feel that if he were alive today in social media currency, he would have, mm. he would be the person who would have millions of followers. <laughs> um, just purely owed to his brilliance and charisma and people wanting to hear his thoughts on the life and world. Mm. Um, um, but but I think he played a very instrumental role. I think most importantly, inculcating uh, the importance of discipline in life, uh, being on time for things, not keeping people waiting. Um, you know, just uh, being a good listener, like basic stuff. I think somewhere just spending my summer vacations with him played a big role in just ingraining some of those things. I don't know how much I adhere to them. I feel I do. But uh, I think those are the things I vividly remember having picked up from him. Interesting. And and can you talk about maybe one or two early experiences uh, that have helped shape you into the person you are today? Anything that comes to mind? You know, all of us have this one or two sort of, you know, uh, turning points, which obviously when we go through them, we don't realize as a child that those were turning points in our life. But any any such incident comes to mind? Yeah, I think uh, there are many, but uh, but I think one that, you know, while I would say, I would like to believe that the trend line of my life has uh, hopefully been in the upward direction for the past, you know, 35 odd years. Mm -hmm. um, but to be honest, looking back, I only remember the times when I fell or I failed, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes quite miserably, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, you know, my brother went to IIT uh, and then to IIM, so in my mm. house it was assumed ki ye to IIT jayega. <laughs> um, and it wasn't even a choice, like I, I remember I wailed and cried that, that I didn't want to do IIT, engineering, science, I wanted to do, do commerce, but it wasn't a decision that was mine, so I had to go do the whole science and IIT thing. Um, and and spent two, three years of my life trying to get into IIT. I did, I studied very hard, made all the sacrifices, like no girlfriends, no parties, nothing, right? 11, 12th, and maybe half of class 10th, I was only studying for IIT. Mm. Um, and, and I remember, and everyone thought, like I remember my brother used to tell his friends in, uh, my brother was already at IIT, and he would tell his friends that, uh, you know, my brother will join next year. Um, mm. It was almost assumed that he would. <laughs> and so there was like no pressure at all. Um, and so, uh, and then I remember the, everyone thought I'll get in. Like I think there was sort of like, okay, he's not that dumb, he should get in, right? Um, and, and I remember that was the first year, 2001 was the first year where the results were coming online for, I, for the JE exam. 
and uh, I was at the screen and pressing refresh, and it was obviously not loading because there was so much traffic. It was like oh god, those days I remember. Yeah, yeah dial-up connection. <laughs> um, so, and then I my my entire I mean, visualized my entire family standing behind me, including my dog, um, waiting for the result to come. And then finally, the result came under my application ID number. It said no rank. Mm. And, uh, which meant that I was not even good enough to get some rank in the thousands. Mm. And I think I turned around, everyone had sort of vanished because everyone was so despondent. Mm. I remember I just went and played cricket for like two, three hours that day. Uh, you know, around those times, it was, uh, it was crazy because um, it, was, it was almost as though um, you know, someone had died in the house, someone had passed mm. away. Like, uh, my aunts would come over, spend time with my parents, etc. I remember one came, one mean one came and said, "No, hamne to pata hi tha, iska nahi hoga, but kuch mm. hota, right?" Mm. Uh, so I think it was, uh, you know, it, uh, society sometimes has a way of really kicking around the, those who have fallen. Mm. But you know, I think at that, uh, for some reason, I I mustered the courage, like learn to just get up, brush off the mud, you know, insulate myself from what the world was saying, and just keep going. I just mm. don't slow down, don't look left, right, up, down, just keep moving forward. And you know, I figured out what I wanted to do next. Uh, I was done with doing what, what others wanted me to do and just pursuing what I felt I wanted to do. I figured out a good college that I wanted to go to, who had, which had a good program, um, you know, uh, worked hard. No one in my extended family had ever given me SATs to get into the U.S. No one in my family had ever set foot in the U.S., like my parents, my brother. Mm. No one had even went to the U.S., let alone to study. Mm. And I got into the college I wanted, you know, literally, uh, um, uh, you know, by, it, it was quite a bizarre experience just showing up with two suitcases and never having spoken with a non-Indian person ever in my life till I landed up um, uh, on my campus. Mm. And uh, for an 18-year-old, it was uh, quite a surreal experience. And then mm. doing three jobs to pay my way through, by having the sense of uh, part responsibility, part guilt that my parents were putting in 100% of their savings into my college education. Mm. I recall when I was applying for my college and they wanted some source of financial proof, uh, or uh, proof of financial source. <laughs> Uh, I recall um, yeah, photocopying my mom's like Indra Vikas Patra, like these are these things you buy from the post office, Correct. which are almost like a FD equivalent. Yeah. We were at BS and you send them lots of photocopies of IVPs, they must be wondering what they were. Mm. But, uh, but I think just uh, going through that whole one year where uh, this sort of like you have failed at, eight, at the seven age, ripe old age of 17, 18, to then mm. finding my way through going to a completely foreign land, uh, mm. putting my feet there as a very shy boy. Right? I was very, very shy, very introverted. Um, and, and then, you know, getting exposed to such incredible, incredibly smart people, amazing professors, exposure to entrepreneurs uh, who had done great things. Mm. Um, I think that was truly transformational for me. So I would say that mm. that whole experience of uh, start to finish was incredibly mm. transformational um, and and even to this day I feel that nothing has likely been more transformational for me uh, than, than that, that experience. one audio period. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm going to take a little bit of a, a digression but I want to share this because it's a video I saw a couple of days ago. Uh, there's this entrepreneur called uh, Sarah Blakely. She runs this uh, D2C consumer brand called Stanks. <laughs> And uh, I was watching her video and she recounted this experience, which I thought was amazing. And she talked about when, when she was a child, uh, every, every, every night or whatever, once a week or whenever it was on the dinner table, her dad would ask her, what did you fail at this week? And basically she would say, whatever, you know, I didn't do well in my chemistry exam. I, you know, I didn't make it to my you know, class team for whatever soccer or whatever it was. And every time he, she'd say that, her dad would give her a high five. And basically, she didn't realize it back then, but it was his way of kind of telling her that, hey, you know what, it, it, it's okay to not sort of uh, uh, succeed at everything you try, but it, 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 it shouldn't sort of demotivate you from sort of you know, continually trying new things, right? And it kind of builds character, builds strength, builds confidence and stuff like that. So uh, I, I thought that was like a really, really interesting thing. And I think something that you said about your experience where 
you didn't get into IIT on your on your sort of uh, uh, in your attempt, but eventually you you know picked yourself up, and you know there were better things waiting for you. Yeah, no, that's a great story about Sarah Blakely also. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm going to maybe just shift gears. Uh, I know we, we we only have 45 minutes more, so I'm going to try and hit upon as much as I can. Um, I'm going to move towards the Snap Deal journey. So, can you talk about, I guess, what was the first taste of success for you uh, at Snap Deal, and what did it teach you? Yeah, so I think um, you may be expecting that I will talk about the first fundraise we did or um, the first sales milestone we hit. It's yeah. actually neither, and I'll mm. maybe rewind back time a little bit to pre snap sure. deal days because okay. I think um, you know that probably the f the most vivid memory of the, of that particular moment uh, probably was a few years before. Um, you know, we had started the company as a coupon book business where we were mm. selling physical coupon books. It was called Money Saver. And it was just mm. the two of us, Rohit and I. And we were essentially running around, uh, you know, Delhi, talking to restaurants, spas, salons, um, you know, sitting outside for hours. Um, these are restaurants where, you know, they would welcome us as, us as guests probably, but the moment we wanted something from the restaurant manager, he'd say, you go sit outside and sit, I'll come. And so we'd wait for two hours, three hours sometimes at receptions of um, offices and, and, and these retail outlets yeah. just to get the attention of the business owner. And this was a time when, you know, nothing, whatever we were doing was not called a startup, right? Like startup was yeah. not part of people's um, <laughs> dictionary. There, there, I would say conversely, there seemed to be an association of adverse selection with those who were doing, not doing a job back yeah. in 2007. Right, they, like in, uh, these guys may not have gotten a job. That's why they are uh, they are doing this whatever thing they are doing, like coupon books, etc. Correct. And it took us uh, nearly two years of just like slumming the streets of Delhi, like in hot weather, wearing coats so that we would look. We were 23. We would look <laughs> older. Like uh, we were doing every possible hustle we could just to get this coupon book out because we had such deep belief that this is going to work. Indians love deals. Indians will love coupon. Indian consumers, and it is just a. We just have to get it out. Like anything to get it out. Let's just get it out, and it will work. We were totally convinced, right? And. And I remember we just finding a printer who would print it because we wanted to have security features uh, so that people don't photocopy the coupons and resell them. We wanted to be very particular about which colors. So only one printer in somewhere in Noida um, who, who had the machinery to print this coupon book. And, but he said, I'm so busy, I'm printing, uh, you know, all kinds of, uh, holograms for the government and I have like my security press is super busy. Only time I can print your coupon book is like at night when I have a maybe a low period when all my uh, primary print jobs are done during the day. And so I recall like I for many days I would just go to uh, um, go to Noida which was very far from where our office was and I would just literally sleep on the shop floor of that printer sit with his designer till like 4 a.m. and then they would print a test run then we would design some more then we would print a test run literally just eating dominoes and sleeping there like mm -hmm. defining how many GSM the cover should be versus the inside pages like every possible detail was being obsessed over for weeks because we were so convinced this would work. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember finally uh, the first print run happened. This was maybe a 4.30 a.m. one day. And um, there the print, the manager there said, here, finally, are you happy? And I had like a pretty stoic face, pretty straight face. I was smiling and all that. And I remember I, I, I used to drive around a, a Zen that belonged to my uh, grandfather, uh, mm -hmm. like a light blue Zen. I used to drive that around. And I just went and sat, went outside the factory, sat inside the Zen. It was dark outside. And, and I remember I just screamed out loud um, with happiness. And and I recall like tears came down my face and I was and I was all alone in the car, but I was very very happy. Um, and I think just I'd ne I'd never never in my life until that point in time created anything. And this was actually the first time I'd studied a lot, I'd gotten a good education, I'd worked at Microsoft for a year, but I'd never really created anything 
uh, which was once a thought and now something in my hand. And I think that just what, what Rohit and I had been able to create at that point in time, that feeling of holding that in my hand, it was like holding a baby, literally a baby. I, I think next time I experienced that feeling was December 31st, 2015. <laughs> but, um, but, but I think that was probably, uh, while it wasn't success per se, because that business, yeah. the product didn't do well, but, but at the same time, it was success for what the objective was at t until that point in time. Yeah, no, I think it's amazing. You know, I think uh, while while uh, you're right, I did expect you will talk about some funding round and you know something related to the business. It's it's honestly as an entrepreneur, it's it's these small moments that you truly cherish, right? Once once all the noise around fundraising and everything sort of dies down. So it's I'm, I'm glad you actually gave that example. Um, talking about, I guess the converse, right? Obviously, you've had your share of ups and downs. Um, can you talk a little bit about just personal experience uh, with, you know, uh, uh, or, you know, any down phase, any tough phase that you've had uh, navigating sort of snap deals through a crisis? There was a time where people had sort of written the company off. Uh, you obviously, you know, a lot of us who knew you uh, personally uh, knew that if there's one person who would steer it back into a position of strength was you, right? And you and Ruth, obviously. Um, but but there were a lot of disbelievers as well, right? Uh, can you talk a little bit about just what what did you go through uh, mentally, uh, uh, emotionally while while uh, you were going through that crisis? How did you bounce back? Um, how has that, I guess, changed your view on entrepreneurship and sort of running companies? Look, I think um, while there seems to have been a lot of focus and reportage on. Um, the period we went through as a company in 2017, yeah. it wasn't the first and, you know, I hate to admit it, but pro likely not the last crisis we will see in our lives, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, I feel that uh, how one deals with, the cri with crises is likely not very different. It's just what is different is the scale of the crisis, hmm. right? Uh, if you learn how to deal with um, problems, issues, um, uh, you know, how, how you get past that moment where you skip a heartbeat, where you get past the moment where you practically can't breathe because the news is that bad. Mm. Once you have experienced it a few times in life, you learn how to get past it. Um, I, I Does don't, it get not, easier? Yeah, it, it, it's not easy, but I would. Argue, it does get easier. I would say. Um, I guess your ability to deal with it becomes becomes. Yeah, absolutely. I think it does. It does. Um, you know, I think um, uh, what I must add here is that I don't think any or getting past any tough phase. Um, you know, it's not like you can read some book and get past it, right? Hmm. Oftentimes, it involves breaking the problem, first taking a deep, deep, really deep breath and saying that, look, okay, we'll get past this. Let's just break this problem into smaller parts. Let's talk it out. Let's discuss it out. That what is it that we can do? What is it that we cannot do? And I think you realize in hindsight that the role that your team plays in helping the company or yourself get out of a situation that is challenging is the most critical thing. Right, I think unless you have the right team in place, a team that believes in you, believes in the business, believes in uh, the fact that why we are here is not because of something wrong that we did, etc., but it's just a you know uh, amalgamation of various circumstances. But we can get past this. Um, so I, I think that that is something that uh, uh, I've realized that in at every point in time, whenever we've uh, had a tough period, what I have done is over index on communicating with the team. Because uh, oftentimes uh, folks think that the team needs the communication from the founder, right? Um, which is true. Uh, because somehow the founder or the founders are the source of the energy for the for the team. I think of it exactly the opposite. Uh, for me, the source of energy in times that are tough is completely is 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 actually the team itself. 
Mm -hmm. um, so I remember in in any tough phase, right? 2013, we were down to one month of money. 2017, uh, well documented period. Uh, so less said the better. Uh, 2008, we were down to one month of money. So I, we've seen so many ups and downs. Like I, uh, what I often I was telling someone the other day that sometimes I look back and and feel that I must be in a movie that a really mischievous writer has written. Um, that it's it's like a roller coaster all throughout, like not necessarily bad only, but uh, there have been many, many good things about it and I'm very thankful and blessed for it. But yeah. it, it, like I sometimes actually genuinely feel I'm, I'm inside a, a movie that someone else has written uh, the script of, uh, given the kind of twists and turns we've seen along the way. Um, but I, 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 I would argue to your point, um, Tarun, about how to get past these tough periods, I would say uh, the the strength and the trust that co-founders have amongst each other, I, I don't think no. any of the tough phases we would have gone through, I could have gone through without Rohit by my side and likely mm -hmm. vice versa. I don't think we would have gotten past any of those if we didn't have a good, a great team that we believed in and that believed in us um, at the same time, irrespective of whatever the world may be saying. Um, yeah. I, I would say these two things are are everything. If you have these two, you have a great partner and you have a great set of uh, folks who um, who trust you and who you trust, you can pretty much get past anything. Um, I think you can be truly free with them and completely open up and invite them into this uh, vulnerable space that you feel yourself to, you find yourself in. Um, and and um, and I think now we've done, we've gone through enough that uh, for us it see it doesn't seem like an unusual thing to do. Um, mm. And and those who've worked with us for many years also also uh, know that. Yeah. No, I think it's such a lovely point you made, which is I think you know as as investors we sometimes are privy to obviously a lot of companies which go through their ups and downs and. You know what really separates, I guess, the ones that that are able to navigate that situation is, is you know, a lot of the stuff that you said just kind of rings home, right? Which is, I've seen, unfortunately, in those times, that's when the co-founder relationship really gets tested, right? Before that, it's a it's a marriage of convenience. You know, people when things are going well, obviously, everyone's happy. But it's it's only in these tough times that that relationship is really tested. And honestly. Unfortunately, that's the first time most, I guess, uh, you know, uh, uh, co-founder relationships that don't work. That's the first time they really know that, I guess, the value system is different, right? So it's it's actually a blessing, like you said, to have somebody who sort of sticks through that tough time and is able to sort of, you know, give you strength and vice versa. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. So... Uh, Every every founder has their unique style, right? And and I'll tell you where this question is coming from. I was I was uh, talking to uh, well, I can say his name. I was talk I was I was with Kunal Shah a couple of weeks ago in in Bangalore, and um, he actually he and I got talking, and he mentioned about um, some uncommon sort of things that he's doing at at Cred, right? Which is oh, what about ten percent ESO pool, non dilutive, always stays that way. You know, wants to share wealth with sort of employees and a bunch of other stuff, right? If you take you know, Bhav and I, direct eye, he's obviously done, you know, extremely well for himself. I remember when, when you know, we were there together back in like, this was like 2009, 10, like the, the kind of stuff, you know, he did back then is, is still stuff of legend even today, right? Which is literally opening up the entire organization's salaries to everybody else, anyone going and deciding their own salary. And then as long as you are able to justify that to, you know, everybody around you, well, you're fine, right? I mean, it was like some really crazy stuff, right, that he, he used to try out um just for the i guess young founders on this call or i guess even the experienced founders uh can you maybe point to a couple of things that you think have helped kind of a are uncommon and b have kind of helped shape the culture at snapdeal yeah i think um i would argue it's the transparency um, mm -hmm. you know i think uh, while a lot of the things that you mentioned are quite impressive um, and you know we've tried to do our version of them through the years, uh, uh, wh whatever they may be. But um, obviously not a contest. But um, but I think uh, for me the number one thing is actually transparency, mm. and it's obviously a fine line, right? Because it's not not super 
super straightforward. It's very hard to be um, uh, to be able to share absolutely everything in the grainiest detail with um, uh, with everyone in the company for a variety of uh, obvious reasons. However, um, I at least I've seen over the last many many years, over the last decade, that the thing that uh, team members really care about is actually transparency. Mm. Like they want to be told the good news. When there is good news, they need to be told the bad news for sure before they find out from someone else. And if someone is talking about bad, ba like giving bad news about the company, uh, whether it's true or not, it's important to address it very, very quickly and, and lay out what the reality is uh, for the team. Mm -hmm. So, um, for me, I think uh, the the number one thing I always ask myself is, what? How can we push the envelope of transparency with our team even more? Like, for instance, we do monthly town halls where we share very transparently how the company did the last month, right? Uh, uh, whether it did well, whether it missed its goals, whether it exceeded its goals, or you know, celebrating uh, good achievements and also calling out where we've fallen behind, right? And 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 at the same time, keeping our do like we don't have cabins in our office, but like being always available if anyone wants to talk to you, at irrespective of what role they do, at what level in the company, hmm. I've realized that over a long period of time. Um, I mean, uh, most folks may not know that, but the average tenure of a team member at Snapdeal is over five years. And um, oh. and this is despite the company having gone through its mm -hmm. um, uh, very well known ups and downs. Mm -hmm. um, but I think why people have stuck with us, stuck with the company over this period of time, is because they know that you know we'll call a spade a spade um, internally for sure. We'll call a spade a spade, right? And and they will get us get the real deal from us always. So mm -hmm. that's if there is one thing we've always indexed uh, over indexed on is transparency. Kunal, can you make it a bit more real? Again, I, I guess when you say transparency, is there any any one incident where I where you know it was extremely I guess inconvenient and uncomfortable for you all to to be transparent with the team and oh yeah absolutely that? can you yeah. can you share just like just to make it more real for everyone? Yeah, in 2017 when we were going through that really uh, uh, treacherous period uh, mm. for the company, where every day you know. Uh, oftentimes, a lot of um, inaccurate reporting was happening um, about the company because it was just it became like a one-upmanship um, mm. period, even for the press, I would say, right? So um, and so, you know, I don't, I don't kind of blame them. I think they, they caught them. They, everyone felt that they had to say something uh, just to attract the uh, eyeballs and the clicks, and they could not say something. They could not sit it out. Um, and that, I can tell you, is an incredibly harrowing experience, obviously for the founders, but it's incredibly harrowing, even more harrowing for the team members because they don't even know half the things or most of the things that are actually happening in these mm. boardrooms, etc. Correct, correct. Um, so they're just guessing and reacting to conjecture. Mm. So what, what um, you know, after finally we decided to go on our independent path, uh, we decided as a board, as a founding team, leadership team that, you know, we want to just uh, continue building our business. Um, I think the first thing we did was just uh, uh, call, like get everyone in a room and lay it out very, very clearly to them that what our insecurities are of taking this path, how much money we have left, um, what all need, will need to be, here are the 25 things that would need to get done for us to come out of this rut as a company. Mm -hmm. And one could argue that, hey, people are anyway so spooked, why are you giving them more reason to be spooked? But this was not a time when you could conceal um, you know, uh, what needed to be told, because first and foremost, we needed to have their trust um, where they needed to, the team needed to feel that these guys are being fully transparent with us about what they are also worried about, yes. um, so that we can all then put our heads together to solve it. Um, and I feel that 
in all of those meetings we did dozens and dozens and dozens of those meetings around this july august period 2017 um, everyone came in with long faces to these meetings but i think they left with a twinkle in their eye um, mm. they left with okay it's not it's not all so bad right like we kind of know what's the really bad parts uh, what are the really really bad parts and what are the you know, uh, fairly resolvable parts. So let's compartmentalize these. I think it just kicks people into motion and, um, you know, it takes this malignancy away from the culture. Uh, just being acutely transparent um, with uh, with what, what, the cir what the circumstances are. Yeah. No, my experience is, I think, you know, unfortunately, sometimes when, when you withhold information, I think you're doing two things, right? One is obviously people tend to assume the worst, and and if they if they don't know what the situation is, obviously they're going to take what's out there and sort of you know imagine it 10x and say, hey, you know what, this is likely way worse than what what is being written about, right? And and I think if you share that openly and transparently, uh, obviously at least people know what the accurate situation is, right? Uh, yeah. Second. Second is I think people like to be uh, I guess you know uh, sort of in the know. Uh, and I have found that most people, I, I have been surprised, like when, when we've seen some of our companies take tough decisions, and, and obviously some companies have managed it better than others, but the ones that truly treat the entire company and every employee as a family, and as a family, I mean, if you're going through a crisis, you, you talk about it, right? You talk about it openly, you say, hey, here's what we're going through, here's what we need to do, here's, here's where you can help. And I, I think companies that have done that communication and in, in sort of sort of, you know, got people into the inner circle, um, have been surprised by how people have risen to the occasion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, moving to the next one, I guess um, I'm going to make a, make a little switch and, uh, you know, move towards your sort of journey as an angel investor and you've done exceedingly well and I think uh, I can see there's a few people on this call that have uh, had the uh, sort of good fortune of uh, having you as an angel in the company, there's several outside of this call as well, but what do you look for in founders? You obviously, like I said, I think you've picked some of the best ones over the, over the recent past. So what is it that you look for? Yeah, I think you're, <laughs> you're very, very kind to me um, on, on this one, given I'm just a part-time, part-timer. On, in, yeah. <laughs> on this side of the well, fence. You, 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 you do extremely well at it being a part-timer. <laughs> Maybe that's the trick. <laughs> uh, just pay uh, little attention. Don't overthink. Take, take more time off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I, look, at the earliest stages of the business, um, yeah, there are very few things to go by uh, to assess the business, right? Um, mm. uh, there is rarely, like, one metric that will get us yeah. to commit. But um, uh, but businesses that tend to lack focus on a very on a single, very sharply defined problem statement tend to be tough for us to wrap our heads around. Mm. Um you know, there's all this stuff uh, we've learned from experience. So, I, as the saying goes, your good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. So, we've made enough bad judgments through the years uh, <laughs> of our own that uh, we've realized that what good ju good judgment looks like, and good judgment, at least in the early stages, and maybe even later, uh, equals focus. Um, mm. uh, you know, broadly, I mean, we've invested in many companies. We've invested in now, I think last count is maybe almost 175 companies. Um, oh, wow. Mostly in India, but, you know, many in the U.S., many in Southeast Asia now. Um, and these uh, scan across like B2C, B2B, marketplaces, direct-to-consumer, fintech, computer vision, stuff I, I would argue I don't even know much about but um, or know nothing about. But I think most businesses can really be distilled down to like some basic questions that you can ask. But that comes later. I think the most important thing is the team. Yeah. Like what have they really achieved in their personal or academic or entrepreneurial or professional lives? Mm -hmm. That can one point to success that they may have had in creating impact, particularly in unstructured or blank slate environments. Right? Can be can they inspire people around them? You know, having uh, uh, you know we we've interviewed thousands of people to hire them over the years. We met 
hundreds, if not you know, thousands of entrepreneurs over the years. I feel that if an entrepreneur can inspire me about his business, um, uh, you know, they they likely, you know, and I'm someone who may, ha I've seen so many that one could argue, you know, you may be pretty fatigued at this point, <laughs> just meeting founders, but I'm not, but like, it's a fair assertion to make. But if they can inspire me so much that I want to like just jump out of the, into the screen and hug the guy, um, mm -hmm. then they can likely mesmerize many others to join hands with them in their journey. Yeah. And I think the team is sort of very critical. The second, I would say, just the attractiveness of the space that they're going after. This is obviously mm -hmm. very tough because in the earliest stages, most right. spaces are non-obvious. I remember when we did the seed round in Ola, like almost 10 yeah. years ago, I mean, there was like Kali Peeli taxis. No one believed they were doing intercity, not intracity. No one believed this business would work. When we right. did uh, the early first round in Urban Company, uh, nobody thought that you could ever make money in, the, in India by uh, employing plumbers and electricians, right? Uh, uh, so when we invested in Mama Earth, nobody thought that a business like um, uh, selling mosquito repellents for kids could ever become large. So I think most of these are fairly non-obvious in the early days. However, the best entrepreneurs tend to be great at helping early stage investors gaze into a crystal ball with them and, and make them dream with them that what can this business become when it grows up. Um, yeah. A third is, you know, just from our own experience and battle scars, uh, just the ability to generate unit economics, right? Uh, uh, many, many businesses that we would look at are pre-revenue, but it is important to determine what the unit economics look like uh, as the business would grow up. The margin structures of a business actually determine the soul uh, of the business, right? Uh, it mm -hmm. determines whether it is a squirrel with a tail or elephant with a trunk. Because yeah. it's tough to go from a 10% margin business to a 50% margin business and still be in the same business. Correct. You know, they both may be great businesses, but they're different businesses then. Um, yes. And understanding how the entrepreneur thinks and values and invests their time and bandwidth um, in in building the right uh, unit economics in the business, uh, really those choices determine what this business will become once it uh, become uh, once it grows up. And, mm. and look, the chances of building a lasting, enduring company will only come if there's a clear path of being completely self-reliant. I think everyone's talking about this now these days, but this wasn't the case as we know up till a few years ago. So I would say it's in summary, it's just the team, the size of the opportunity, the ability to generate economics. And I would say the team is like 80% of what we would look at. Yeah. So I'm going to give one small anecdote again, because again, it's something that Honestly, I see as a as a highlight of my investing career, but and I, I have you to thank for it. Uh, I remember this was about 2000, I guess 12, and I was spending time with Bhavesh Atola, and I remember calling you for a reference call about Bhavesh. And I think there was there was one line you said which kind of uh, uh, sealed the deal at least for me. And I after like asking you like you know, 20 different questions in different ways about, hey, what yeah. is he good at, blah, 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 you know, <laughs> things. I was uh, getting a headache, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I remember- I was I just being polite. Line, yeah, I remember one line you said, and you said, uh, I see a little bit of myself in him, right? And I think, uh, uh, honestly, it, it, that gave me a lot of confidence. And obviously, we, we ended up investing in Babesh and Ola, and, you know, uh, it's a well-known story today. but. Tell me, you know, when you say, I see a little bit of myself. I think I would just say, that. now I should be saying, uh, uh, you know, I hope, I hope he sees a little bit of me in him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, you're being too humble. No, but so you, you said team, right? And again, I, 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 this is something that, you know, obviously I, I spend my entire day thinking about, uh, you, you meet a lot of entrepreneurs. What are the common characteristics? Like if you were to like unit economics, you know, business, business model, obviously a lot of these are, are, are um, you know, hard to see at the earliest stages, right? Especially where you and I invest. But uh, if you have seen any common patterns amongst the founders that have gone on to do well, right? Or who have gone on to build a really large company. Uh, yeah. Can you maybe pinpoint like two, three things uh, uh, again? Yeah, absolutely. I think the first and foremost is what I referred to earlier, focus, right? And and I think uh, sometimes focus is um, mistaken or misunderstood, right? Mm -hmm. Focus is not about doing less, but rather doing more of what matters the most. 
Um, you know, sometimes focus seems like this unexciting thing. It's not. You can do tremendous, ex tremendously exciting things, but within very well-defined guardrails. Uh, this is something I had no clue about when we were building our business in the early days, right? I had no idea what, like, the, the virtues of what the virtues of focus are. I think since our youngest, uh, earliest memories as kids, I remember my whenever I used to be my naughty self, my mom used to always say, "Bit of focus, karo." Right. Mm -hmm. um, I think I never understood the meaning. I think only after a lot of uh, experience, trial, errors, mistakes, uh, burning my hands, it's only after that I truly understood the value of focus. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that um, obviously the ecosystem has matured and many have many smart entrepreneurs have learned from the less lessons folks like us learned um, and mistakes we made that um, uh, you know, uh, most of them are now very, very focused from the get-go. Mm. But whenever they would deviate, I think we are there to help them. That's our role as mentors in some ways. I think that's one. Um, the, the second thing is they're extremely, extremely obsessed with uh, with customer experience, whether it's a B2B customer or a B2C customer, to a, to a fairly, um, uh, uh, you know, extreme degree. And and that is, uh, you know, one realizes that that has to, uh, in any business, that has to come from the founder. That obsession for experience has to come from the founder. Um, the, the moment you are okay with a, you know, bad experience, suboptimal experience as a founder, you've set a new low bar in the company, because everyone will now feel that that's the bar that they need to watch out for. Rather, I think the, I've seen the best founders tend to keep raising the bar on experience. And again, this is a lesson we've learned the hard way because early days of e-commerce were so chaotic, uh, just convincing sellers to come on board, convincing customers to come on board. There are discounts flying around, coupons flying around, products flying around, uh, you know, in some cases, mangoes and stones flying around in packages. Um, that it was very hard to just focus on uh, you know uh, uh, doing all the things you could do for customer experience not because we didn't want to but we just didn't understand all that we could do um, and it took a while for us to get our heads around to that but I would say that you know the, the brightest entrepreneurs these days have have that as a core tenet in whatever they do um, thirdly I think um, uh, uh, thirdly, I, I feel particular to um, uh, you know pretty much any any possible type of founders, any possible type of business, uh, not particular to any kind of business, is the ability to just attract fantastic talent, right? Often talent that's more experienced than them, maybe even more professionally accomplished than them. Um, and that is super critical. Without that, you just can't move forward. Uh, and I think that's held true. That is one thing I would say from the early days we've done okay. Um, that from the earliest days, somehow Rohit and I have been able to attract really the best and the brightest um, to come work with us and build whatever we are building together with us. Uh, but these three attributes would be uh, likely the, the thing things that I've seen the most focus, um, you know, then obsession about customer experience, and third is the ability to attract fantastic talent early on. Yeah. Has, has you being a investor and sort of seeing things uh, a little bit from a distance, I guess, has that in any way uh, sort of changed how you run Snapdeal? Yeah, I think um, in many ways it has. I feel that um, when you talk to these really incredible founders, I see many of them are here in the in the chat today. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's uh, thanks for the support, guys. Um, but um, but I think I've learned so much from them, right? Like I would have learned, um, like Bhavish is an incredibly ambitious, aggressive entrepreneur. He's a go-getter. I learned that from him. Uh, from Abhiraj, I learned. Um, you know, he's he's really incredible with people, uh, really incredible with the obsession with experience, which comes out in their service. I learned that from him. Um, even amongst the younger entrepreneurs, I see Anirudh here from Pepper. Uh, I saw him a short while back. And, yeah. and, you know, the speed at which he moves, the ambition that he has uh, running through his bloodstream is so inspiring for me. Um, 
I think every entrepreneur inspires me to be a better version of myself, uh, professionally, personally, in their own small way and likely unknown, small or big way, and likely unknown to them. Um, and and I think investing has also helped both Rohit and I to stay intellectually relevant, um, so that as we get older, we don't become like these old uh, foggies um, who just don't know how the how 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 to compete in today's world. Um, so I think it does keep us intellectually relevant, and also it ensures that monotony doesn't set in in our our own lives. Because keeping that energy level high is super critical when you are in this uh, long marathon. Correct, correct. No, absolutely. So I'm going to ask you a question, which which I think uh, uh, you know Indian VCs get a lot of brickbat, a um, lot of sort of you know criticism, saying we aren't sort of uh, we don't take enough risk, we don't invest in true moonshots. And it's it's partially true, right? Uh, you know, give or take. I think you know there are definitely things that all of us can do better. Um, as an angel, as an entrepreneur, uh, and obviously as an ecosystem, we're still way way younger than our sort of uh, valley and maybe in China counterparts, right? So, what would you like if you had a if you? I mean, again, you've seen so many different fundraisers of your own. You've you've seen it from a distance, maybe with so many of your portfolio companies. Where do you think we need to sort of um, shift things to to sort of just make the ecosystem better for everyone? I have a very simple answer, Tarun. Yes. Are you ready for it? Yes. Just <laughs> just fund more founders where Titan is an investor. <laughs> we're we're correcting that mistake. You 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 and I have chatted about that all. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Seriously, so what, what 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 should we do? I guess what what can we do to serve this ecosystem better? I think um, you know I feel while brickbats will come, um, I I always I tell myself I tell founders who would listen to me, um, even investors who are friends that fundamentally we can't fear being wrong, right? People mm. will judge us anyways. Mm. So I just don't bother. <laughs> I don't bother that much about um, you know uh, what I could do, what I should do, etc. I tend to just focus on what what I believe is the right thing to do. I feel mm. um, I, the great thing is we are seeing almost every investor, like all investors, are friends of ours, and and we many of them we've known for over a decade. Everyone is doing well, right? Like if if I look around, yeah, some may be doing a little better than others, but everyone is doing well, and. And um, and I feel that uh, uh, while you know it's it's a nice um, uh, it's it's always this thing that you know a, a entrepreneurs are are uh, you know talking about VCs etc behind their backs. I think it's a well known fact. Yeah. I I just don't worry too much about it. I feel as long as you just keep funding Titan uh, uh, funded uh, founders, I think you'll be fine. <laughs> Point noted, and I think uh, that that's a chat we need to have because there are there are a bunch of them we're in, and obviously we need to get into more. So, uh, understand. Okay, uh, shifting gears. I I I know we're going to be running out of time, so I, I'm just going to try and move uh, through the rest of the questions a bit more quickly. You mentioned mentorship, right, as one of the things that uh, we spoke about uh, uh, in the in the previous section. Uh, a lot of founders obviously are doing this for the first time, right, and some I have. Observe from you know personal experience uh, some who have really benefited, um, and for whatever reason you know others haven't taken to it as as naturally. Uh, what is your advice to young founders? Is it is it is it important? Is it critical? Is it absolutely necessary for every founder to sort of set up uh, one or two sort of strong uh, mentor relationships? Yeah, I think um, look the. I always feel that the shoe that fits one pinches the other, right? Yeah. Uh, so no one size will fit all. So I don't think there is a truism that will apply to everyone. Hmm. Um, uh, uh, but but look, I think um, mentorship is very important. When we were starting our company, there was no concept of mentorship. There was no one we could go to for mentorship. Most of the VCs hadn't built businesses. Most of the VCs hadn't seen businesses get built in their portfolios also. 
right? Because everyone was operating first funds, which were 2007, 2008 yeah. vintage. Um, so everyone was sort of like grasping at straws at that mm. point in time. And as a result, I feel that we made, we likely in hindsight made a lot more mistakes than we would have had we had good mentorship. The good thing is that the tribal knowledge in our ecosystem is now so incredibly rich um, and so easily accessible that if you are a hard charging, motivated, smart um, entrepreneur going after a big market, you will find great mentors, right? And um, uh, and they will, you know, uh, hopefully guide you in the right direction and ensure that you don't deviate, deviate from your path. Um, look, I think for <laughs> I, you know, I I as. I feel that my kids have taught me how to be a good investor. Like for instance, you can't go tell a two-year-old, uh, you can't reason with a two-year-old to go, that they need to go and sleep, they need to go and sleep now, right? Like you have to make them realize that that's the right thing to do. So oftentimes with entrepreneurs, while they're very mature, they're not a two-year-old, obviously, they're, they're very mature, they're very smart, and they're so convinced about what they feel is the right thing to do uh, for the business. However, if you strongly believe as a mentor that that's not the right thing to do, uh, it is your responsibility to make them realize that in a way that they will get it. Um, and and I do take that upon myself as a responsibility because, you know, the investing in companies is not about just give some money and then, you know, sort of fill it, shut it, forget it. Um, investing in companies is about taking this responsibility that you are now essentially the the founder's brother, you know, you know, whatever you want to call it, like mentor, brother, um, well-wisher, uh, partner, uh, but uh, all of those tags come with a great sense of responsibility um, mm. alongside. And, and I do take it very, very seriously. Like any entrepreneur, if they call me, I, you know, most, they, most entrepreneurs would say I'd, I'm usually available in a matter of uh, hours, if not minutes, uh, and rarely days. Um, mm. Because I know that when they are calling, it is likely quite important. Uh, and and I may be the first person they may be calling, but I may also be the person whose, whose uh, word they may trust the most. Um, yeah. And hence I see, see it as a, uh, as a really, really incredible, uh, I see it with an incredibly important uh, sense of responsibility that, that uh, they are imposing upon me. But I feel in a in a nutshell, mentorship is now, uh, you know, par for the course, and and uh, I think every entrepreneur must seek out on must seek out mentors. I I wish you know I just want to I, like both Rohit and I we just want to help founders, right? Like, given there wasn't much of an ecosystem, as I said when we started, um, now that there is an ecosystem, I don't think we can help everyone, but at least my hope is that over the next 10 years, if I can help a thousand founders, um, yeah. I think that be, uh, hopefully that will create needle moving experiences for the ecosystem. Yeah. By the way, Kunal, I've got a couple of offline pings requesting if uh, uh, you can maybe stay back for a few minutes more for some audience questions. Would that be yeah, okay? Sure, yeah. My, my okay, so out for a dinner and my kids are sleeping, so I'm good. <laughs> Nothing better to do on a Tuesday night anyway. So so let me, uh, so guys, uh, I, I'm going to actually request a few people. I, I can see, I'm just looking at the top of the screen, Deepak, Mithin, Tarana, Samaga, uh, Adil, Sumit. Uh, there's a bunch of you, uh, uh, Kuldeep, you know, Madhav, I see so many of you all. Would, would really be great if if you all have any question, I guess just ping me offline, I'll, I'll, I'll add you to the... Uh, speaker list and you know would love to make this more interactive i'm going to just maybe wrap up with one or two final questions from my side and then uh, you know we can try and take a few audience questions uh, talk a little bit about i guess uh, you, you spoke about how you're so quickly available for founders uh, i've personally experienced that there's rarely a day where i've reached out to you asking for a call and like you said if not in 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 you know minutes it's literally in hours that you know you will make sure you will you will, you know, uh, make time for me. And I, I can imagine how many other people you do that for, right? Uh, I've spoken to you about, I guess, my struggles with staying on top of email and WhatsApp. And all of us are inundated, right, every day. Uh, and and you, you actually made, said something last time we spoke, which 
kind of blew my mind and you said you know what i actually don't get so much email and i actually don't uh, sort of uh, 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 feel the pressure to sort of uh, be constantly on uh, and and yet sort of you're you're doing what you're doing and you know are probably more tenx more productive than 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 most normal people so uh, i want to spend maybe a couple of minutes in just if you can share a little bit of like just productivity hacks you know whatever you might term them anything that you've sort of inculcated i'm sure you've iterated over it over a period of time so so what's your productivity system you're very kind tarun um you know i it's only when you asked me that day when we were speaking maybe a month ago i mentioned it but you know i never thought about it um but but i i think i broadly just for the group i told tarun that day that outside of like reports like we have a lot of like um, scheduled reports around the business etc that come in and i look at them um at depend at a certain frequency but in terms of emails i probably get like maybe 40 50 emails a day max right like i don't get more than that um <laughs> that's not an invitation to send more emails but uh, <laughs> but uh, i don't get more than that right uh, i think it's a function of we have a fantastic uh, fanta- we have a fantastic team in at snapteal that that you know ensures that uh, uh, rohit and i while we are very hands on entrepreneurs we are not being unnecessarily exposed to every uh, every bit of the sausage making mm-hmm. similarly we have a fantastic team at titan right uh, bipin and uh, and and others on his team are great like they they shield me and rohit from the complexity where our value add is the end decisioning um i don't think before that our role is particularly important and so i think that for some reason maybe because i'm inherently maybe a lazy person we set up structures in a way that uh, uh spending i end up spending time on really only the important things and not mm. get exposed to things that suck me in um and and i think the second thing is uh, i i'm not saying others do this but i actually don't waste any time um so i don't do anything outside of the time i spend on snap team time i spend with founders uh through titan and my immediate family yeah. uh, and now i play football every day as i told you so i actually don't do anything else um now that may sound really boring and my op- like uh, uh like or un- he's leading such an uninteresting life but this works for me right i'm i lead a fairly undistracted life that way so on on the three things that i really care about i spend an enormous amount of time um mm. and 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 uh, so so i think that's that's on that and then finally i usually find time to do whatever i i enjoy doing right so and um and which is why like i like i enjoy talking to you right so whenever you'll reach out i look forward to the time when we'll actually get on the call because i know we'll talk about some interesting things right and some interesting mm. company some yeah. interesting trend um i learn something really good i i think i i sort of look forward to the things i would enjoy doing and then that doesn't seem like work to me uh, which is why i'm happy to do it at any time of the day many times i talk to entrepreneurs post midnight um very often like i'll be exchanging messages with with founders at like 2 am if i'm up right um, so for me it's not like the boundaries are not very sharp uh, and all my time is dedicated only to these three things yeah no that's super helpful uh okay last question from my side and then i guess uh, i will i will hand it over to a few people i by the way added some people as speaker i'll i'll add probably a couple of more that have asked for questions but let me maybe shoot one question and then i'll 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 hand it over sure sure so uh i guess when you when you uh, um again you and i spoke through the pandemic and you were talking about i guess new habits you've you've taken on um and all of us have kind of somehow you know made some adjustments to our lifestyle especially in the last year right uh can you talk about i guess anything uh, uh that you started doing that you find um just helpful overall that helps you focus better be more productive maybe it's a morning routine maybe it's taking up a sport but maybe it's something else but but anything that you can share uh, just a little bit more i guess personal side yeah sure i think um, firstly 
you know, one of the things that uh, sort of helped a lot, um, uh, helped a lot in my life is in general, like eliminating attachments. Um, so I think some people who know me well know that, like, I, I lead a fairly asset like life, right? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, you could argue that our ownership in companies are assets, right? Like, but yeah. I don't, I don't view them as such, right? Uh, I view them as a piece of paper that formalizes our relationship with the founder. And mm -hmm. if it works out, it gives us fuel to back the next generation or next cohort of yeah. founders, right? I don't think of it as an asset while I, I see why many others may think of it like that. Mm -hmm. But in general, I lead a fairly asset light -like life, right? Like I stay in a rented apartment. I've lived here for five, six years. Before that, I was to live with my parents. I drive the same car that I've driven for mm -hmm. the last seven, eight years. Um, and I think that has um, that has helped. Like I, I would argue, my wife tells me all the time, let's buy a house and, you know, we'll have some safety, security in mm -hmm. businesses. Ka kya pata? You've seen ups and downs. So it's like, I get that lecture every month or so. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, she tells me like, like, what are you going to do with the paper of all these companies, etc. if you don't have a house <laughs> over <Yeah. after. laughs> So I think there is, um, but I feel somehow like just eliminating all these attachments and like and leading the asset light life has actually helped me to be mentally quite sane and happy um, mm -hmm. through the years. I don't have to worry about too many things that I that I would own, right? Um, I think that's that's one one important thing that that I think mentally I've gone through through the years. The second thing is. Um, you know, health scares tend to uh, make you really reflect on your life a little bit, right? Uh, yeah. Especially after you have kids. Like my daughter was born on 31st December 2015 and my life has never been the same since then. You know, and parenting brings about a level of detachment to purely financial outcomes that is actually healthy uh, in a way. Um, and it sort of in general increased my empathy, patience, just desire to work with those who only care about who care about the relationships versus uh, you know just being very transactional, um, and and it, something that gives me and only wanting to work on things that gives me a sense of purpose professionally, intellectually, etc. While keeping my family as the number one priority, mm. right? Um, I was talking about the health care. Like I I realized about two years ago that I had a very very high chances of getting diabetes given mm. um, my father is diabetic, my grandmother passed away because of diabetes. And I realized that a very, very high chance, there's a greater than 90% chance what the doctors told me that, that I would have diabetes, which is why I gave mm. up sugar, right? This mm. part is not known. It's only known that I gave yeah. up sugar. It was not known why. Mm. And that's why I gave it up. I think in normal circumstances, I may not, I may have just said, look, I'll, I'm still okay. Like on the age front, I'll deal with it later. But, you know, I, I, after my daughter was born and I'll also add after my son was born because he'll be very angry if I only take, <laughs> although he's only three. Uh, yeah. um, but after my daughter was born, I think I, I've just had this desire to live as long as I can. And so I'm doing everything I can to enable that, right? Like uh, reduce my risk of contracting diabetes. So, you know, I'm happy to share that, you know, I actually have been testing myself every three months since that day. And I've, um, only once gone past the red line and every for the last six quarters I've been um, I've been uh, in the green green zone and the doctor is surprised that I have continued to do that because they didn't expect it um, mm -hmm. and uh, and so so I think um, just uh, having that sense of greater purpose uh, has has sort of really helped um, uh, in, in in some ways over the last many years Excellent. No, and I know you've you've written about how it's also actually helped you just be a lot more focused. Yep, that too. That too. So Kunal, I know you're out of time and, and you've actually overshot your time by, by 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 I think 20 minutes. So really appreciate it. I think it's been a fantastic session. I know we can probably go on for hours talking about uh, about you know various topics and answering questions. Uh, but but Kunal, thank you so much for doing this and thank you for everyone joining in uh, apologies if the start was a bit choppy we, i was doing this for the first time so still getting used to the platform but i think it went off pretty well so appreciate uh, everyone joining in for the support uh, uh, really really enjoyed i guess interacting with everyone and uh, kunal super thanks to you thank you thanks Tarun. it was a pleasure and thank you everyone for 
for joining and spending so much time with us. Uh, and Tarun, you were fantastic as expected. Great. Thank you, everyone. And hope to be back here soon for uh, for another one. Good night, guys. Good night. Thanks, uh, Tarun and Kunal. Great session. Great. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good See you. Thanks for tuning in. For more Matrix Moments episodes, you can head to www.matrixpartners.in/blog. You can also follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube for more updates.